Hi, I'm Guy Powell, and welcome to the next episode of The Backstory on Marketing. If you haven't already done so, please visit ProRelevant.com and sign up for all of these episodes and podcasts. I am the author of the upcoming book, The Post-COVID Marketing Machine, Prepare Your Team to Win. Today, we're speaking with Pete Kelso, VP of Agency Par Partnerships at Full Throttle. So let me tell you a little bit about Pete. Pete's been working in marketing and production for 20 years, serving various roles, including as a program manager for Commonwealth McCann and had the Chevy account. He's now with Full Throttle Technologies as VP of Agency Partnerships. Full Throttle Technologies is a leading SaaS marketing company focused on delivering cutting edge applications and data services. Pete's job is to seek out curious marketers who are focused on first party data and attribution. His passions are in uh, business, learning, and, and also in people. So Peter, welcome. Hey, thanks Guy, it's great to be here. It's nice to see you again. Yeah, definitely, and uh, looking forward to our chat. So uh, why don't we get started and uh, tell us a little bit about how you got into marketing and uh, how you got to where you are today. Oh, sure. That's, uh, it, it always starts with a failure, right? So I'll wind the clock back all the way to the late 80s when, uh, before I was uh, a true paid marketer, but my first effort towards marketing really came, actually, there's two things that, that uh, come up. It's one being in student council, I think in sixth grade, and putting together a charity event that we did and just getting out there and grinding and finding businesses that would help uh, support our event by making donations. And I quickly realized that I liked it and that I like to promote things. I like to launch things. And I like to, like you mentioned, I like people, I like connecting. Um, so that wasn't so much of a failure, but the next one was about a year later, I decided that I was going to pivot from mowing lawns in my neighborhood to babysitting. So I put together my first uh, stab at print or direct mail and started <laughs> filling the mailboxes of my neighbors with uh, a flyer telling me, telling them that the kid they probably barely trusted to mow their lawn was now ready to watch their children. And so that was the failure that, um, that I mentioned, but I knew early on that I liked connecting, creating, promoting things. And so I just took that interest and applied it towards my education. Went to Western Michigan University. I studied advertising and production. My persistence came into play again when the advertising department was a little bit booked up and I had to repeatedly hound the dean to make sure that he let me in. And after two or three semesters of me bugging him once or twice uh, a month, he let me in and I uh, got to learn a whole lot about marketing or at least what I thought, right? Because you can only learn so much in school. Then I got out of school and realized that I had a whole lot more to learn, got involved in the Detroit automotive marketing community, which really is an exciting place. Lots of big budgets, right? These automotive companies spend a ton. And so what I noticed early on is that we were doing some things maybe that other industries weren't or before other industries. And so I got exposed to a lot of excitement and I just never looked back from there. Started as a freelancer, working with the automotive big three, doing uh, experiential events, doing marketing and business to business training, events, sales training. And, and what I realized is that marketing's a part of everything. Marketing's a part of that training that they're giving to their dealers. Marketing is a part of the education uh, and the sales process. And that the more that you can put marketing into messaging and uh, realize how important it is to connect with people, the more you can get the right message across. And so it's all not necessarily about finding that audience, but having the right message for that audience. So not just finding, but knowing the audience. And now fast forward to where I am now. And that's literally what we do at Full Throttle is we identify anonymous website visitors and create audiences and opportunities for businesses to reach them. And so I don't get so much involved in the messaging and the content right now, but it's really exciting to be able to create at-bats for businesses and uh, connect those at-bats and those opportunities to actual sales. And we do that by identifying and marketing and then measuring and connecting those dots, which I know you as an analytics guru 
uh, could you could talk all day about attribution and it's really nice when it's simple when it's here's person a here's all the stuff that we sent them did they buy or not and so you don't have to worry about an impression or lift you can connect one to one and uh, so so full circle uh, that's where that's where I started and, and who knows where I'll go yeah, absolutely. And uh, and you're so right about uh, the one to one and being able to connect the dots. And that's certainly what our business is about in terms of analytics. Uh, but it's into also interesting. Uh, Jamie Turner, a good friend of mine, uh, he just finished a book called uh, An Audience of One, which is hyper targeting and almost getting down to that one to one marketing. And so really, really, really true. And marketing, uh, if you can get down to that audience of one and be able to scale your messages and what have you to that. It, it really makes a big difference. I also like your story about going out and being the babysitter. My son went the other way. <laughs> he was a babysitter and then he went and uh, did his marketing. He did a whole bunch of uh, you know, uh, uh, mailbox posts and what have you and stuffed the mailboxes. And he started a, uh, a lawn service and he was, uh, he was great at it. He made some good money doing that. Yeah, I never made money at either of them, but I just figured if they're going to give me free pizza to, to sit and watch TV at their house, that's a whole lot easier than sweating it out in the, uh, in the backyard. But um, I think I stuck to the lawn mowing for the most part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, he actually did pretty good. He, he had one or two guys working with him and he bought equipment, he bought a weed whacker and what have you. And, uh, and he was really able to, you know, offer a good service, make some good money, pay, buy the equipment and then sell it. And so he did pretty good, but uh, enough about that. That's uh, I like though that that bringing that uh, that that concept that marketing is in is in everything, and certainly when you're uh, marketing for the automotive companies where their budgets are in the billions, you really get to see how marketing can do every last little thing, and it's just I, I find it fascinating. I find it absolutely fascinating. It, it, it absolutely is. In those big budget programs, they have so many stakeholders involved that even just pitching and launching a big program like that, you have to create a, a marketing campaign uh, around a pitch sometimes to make sure that you can really check the box for every single one of those uh, stakeholders and play nice. But somehow yeah. put it. Chevy's still wow. around. I guess it's because of me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> good, good. Yeah, good way to do that. That's fantastic. So, uh, well, unfortunately, though, uh, the uh, the future here, certainly with COVID and what have you, is uh, a little bit uncertain. Hopefully, it's getting more certain. So, what do you see as the challenges coming up for 2022 for marketers, uh, big ones and small ones, and and any of them across the board? Well, I think obviously we know that um, there's changes happening every single day when it comes to privacy and the cookie world is is on the horizon or we're already in it so that's that's a known challenge that i think everyone's aware of but i think as it, how it relates to covid is that we're going to continue to see especially uh, on digital is more at-home shoppers more people in their in their households that are um, going through that that entire customer journey or maybe a larger portion of that customer journey because COVID was pretty well timed with a very challenging time for brick and mortar retail, for all of these other factors. It was really, it's really unfortunate for a lot of, um, I guess, marketers and retailers that were uh, struggling to reinvent their journey. Maybe it's a push in the right direction where they just needed to go all in on digital and uh, figure out a way to create a more unique customer experience if, if they're going from digital to some sort of in-person or brick and mortar. So I think the main challenge that I see is, is really just connecting that experience. How do you connect it? Not, so, not just from a, an analytics and a marketing and a measurement standpoint, but how do we do it in a way that uh, can impact and, and drive consumer behavior? And so that's what's exciting for me and why I like where I'm at is that, like I mentioned, I'm not so much involved in the messaging, but to be able to provide those opportunities for marketers, to be able to talk with agency leaders on a daily basis, big and small, in different industries and different brands and find different ways that we can help them through creating those opportunities by creating opportunities for reach and measurement 
to have those complement what they're already doing. And I think, you know, you mentioned I search for the curious, I, I do. And I never claim that we're gonna be this one size fits all, the only solution that you'll ever need again. And I think anybody who is taking that sort of approach really needs to pick their head up out of the sand and realize that it's gonna be a number of different things that, uh, and factors and new tools and solutions that have to be incorporated and that the right partners are the ones that are willing to be flexible, that are willing to listen and learn and, and then present with a more open-minded nature and not this one size fits all approach. So the most exciting conversations that I have going on, besides the ones where they just say, yeah, I'll take it. Let's, let's, uh, let's start doing business. I'll send you a PO, which rarely happens, are the longer ones where I'm learning about what their needs are, where we as a company are learning about ways that we can check different boxes and be flexible, but in a scalable way and making new partnerships and strategic partnerships with other solution providers so that we can sort of work together to solve those problems, which is what I did a lot of when I worked on the Chevy account, because there was always 10 different companies and stakeholders and stages. So to see it on a small and large scale on a daily basis is uh, it's exciting for me. And I think those curious ones that are seeking out new technology and solutions, I sure hope that they find me or that I find them. Yeah, you're right about the uh, curiosity and and uh, the I, and I think a, a lot of you know especially what I would say are the best in class marketers are the ones that really uh, that really look and are curious about new opportunities to be able to do with that one little thing significantly better. I really like your 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 mention too about the customer experience, and I was talking to a friend of mine about that the other day, and and I was using Apple. <clears throat> As a, as an example, when you buy an Apple phone, and uh, and now I haven't bought an Android, but it, uh, when you buy an Apple phone, for example, certainly the the customer experience starts even before you buy it. Then you actually you know do your investigation. Okay, so you buy it and you get it. And you get this little box and what have you, and you bring the box home and it's this really well laid out box. So they've already gone from the pre sale to the sale. And now you're in the post sale and you open up the box or you open up the laptop or the iPods or whatever it is. And it's got all this stuff that's perfectly laid out. And so now they've got the customer experience right to the post sale. And mm -hmm. people are then are going to talk about that. They're going to go on social about that or going to tell their friends about uh, maybe not only that, but, you know, certainly the product and that whole experience and what Steve Jobs was able to put together, uh, you know, for all of Apple, really, really makes a difference. So, you know, that experience is a is, that customer experience journey is really uh, so critical. Yeah, and and it goes to show you the value. It's unquantifiable, the value of acquiring a customer that's going to become part of your advocate army. And you know, we we deal with whether it's a home services company that's smaller or a giant brand like that, you know, there's a, there's a, a brand I can't mention in the, in the golf industry that we're talking with. And my father-in-law just bought a new club from them. And, and he is as brick and mortar as it comes, wants to, you know, if, he, if he's buying a new bike, he literally went to the store so much that when my mother-in-law came in to finally buy the bike that was his gift, but he had to do like nine months worth of research, they were happy to finally get him out of their hair, right? He's a great guy, but he's an advocate for them now. And now for him to go through that experience digitally, he, he is going to tell everybody not how he's hitting that driver, but about that experience. And you, you can't quantify that value. So if I can give more opportunities for people to become advocates that, you know, it's, it's really fun. And I think that the, the um, something, something my dad told me He's, a, he's a, a retired painting contractor, and he said, commerce follows the path of least resistance. And mm -hmm. I think making that experience fun and easy is something that the ones that are doing it right, they just have down, and that creates that advocacy. You know, I, I, I like the example of like Ikea furniture, that their instructions have no language, right? They sell it all over the world, and like every other catalog or instructions that you open up and you see all those other languages, your head immediately starts to spin, you lose the page that you're on. 
but Ikea takes a different approach and just keeps it simple. And a lot of us feel like it's like we're playing adult Legos when we're putting together that furniture that looks nice, that lasts, but that, that experience goes beyond the sale. And I think that's what creates that advocacy. And when someone puts together an Ikea uh, set of furniture, they usually like to tell them somebody else, yeah, I put this together. It was easy. It was a lot easier than I thought. And, you know, to see that uh, and feel that experience with Apple, I mean, they, they're always at the top um, of the list when it comes to that experience and the, the amount of thought that's put around every single point um, in that process, you know, and it, and it really never ends. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, it, it's them as well as uh, even Amazon. They kind of, they just to your point, they set the standard for customer experience and shopping experience on Amazon. And, and then when you go to another company in any industry and you want to buy some furniture and, and if they don't have that same kind of a, an experience, you go, man, this is, they're just like, you know, decades behind what, what they could be doing compared to what Apple and, and Amazon are actually doing today and, and really leading the industry. That's, that's for sure. Yeah. And I think that sounds like opportunity to me. Those are the people I'm always trying to find, you know, furniture industry is a great example because there are all these independent furniture retailers out there that may or may not have a robust website. Maybe they don't even have the uh, e-commerce capabilities incorporated into their site and they wanna get people to their store. And that's great, but to find those people, to nurture them, to get them down to that funnel, you've gotta have that storefront that's everywhere and that, that's the web. And so if you can start that experience there and give that option so that it's not just this appointment you know, driven, I have to go to the store when I find time, but really cater that experience around the customer. It really doesn't matter what you're selling. So my, my advice to anybody would be make sure your front door is always open and inviting and that front door is, is your website. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to your point as well uh, from before that COVID uh, and then this lockdown and it really forced a lot of uh, the retailers to relook at what was going on in the digital space because that was their front door their otherwise their front door their physical front door was locked and was staying locked for quite a while one of our clients as well they took that time and redid their back end on, a, on their it redid their their whole website and so that they were much better and much more focused on the e-commerce experience and then looking at ways to uh, offer new new products and services uh, over, you know, through e-commerce as opposed to just the, just the brick and mortar. Yeah. And, and you talk about new services, look at, uh, look at the restaurant industry and how much that is, is changed because people are starting to go back out or they are going back out now, you know, the, the poor restaurants are still having a difficult time with resourcing and staffing. But I think one of the reasons is because, they're doing so much more carryout business now and this new, you know, it's obviously they were doing it before, but now they have this whole new revenue stream. And, you know, you think about that customer experience. And I sometimes think as I'm sitting in a restaurant, why is it taking me longer to get my food when I don't necessarily see a packed restaurant? And then I look over by the front door and I see a giant stack of carryout orders. And I think what a good problem for that restaurant to have but they've got to figure out how do we make sure that it doesn't impact the customer experience for the folks that are in there, especially because a lot of times those are higher profit margin yep. um, customers because they're having the alcoholic beverages and things like that. But really, you've got to, you've got to look at it from all angles. And yeah. um, that front door always needs to be open to, to grow. But um, you know, we use the, the analogy because our technology was made for car dealerships. And you can think of it both ways, but we would say if, if 100 people came into your store or your dealership, you'd want to greet, smile at, ask every single one of them, can I help you, right? So that's what we want to design our websites to be able to do. And everybody's fighting for attention conversions to try to, to uh, bring those people in through the funnel. But then if you look at it the other way, you got to make sure, at least for that restaurant example, that you're not making the person that is in the store feel like you're saying hi too much to, to the people on the website. So it's a it's a difficult balance, but I think a good problem to have. It, and you're seeing it in a, in a lot of other industries. Any way that you can put more doors out there, it's a good thing. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, your restaurant restaurant example, I don't I don't think the concept of the ghost kitchen uh, was out there prior to covid. And uh, and now one of the uh, clients we've been uh, working with, they actually started two brands uh, and another friend of ours uh, who uh, who has a restaurant chain. They've started two other brands as well of uh, ghost kitchens where you can only buy them on DoorDash or only buy them on, on Uber Eats. And what a, what a fascinating change that took place because of right. COVID. And I think too, uh, on those delivery customers, you don't get the alcohol revenue and the alcohol margins, but I think you're paying then the list price, so to speak, or you can plan and really optimize the costs and the pricing to those because you now have volume to be able to to calculate against so a very interesting concept very very interesting yeah. and especially if you don't have staff if you've got enough cook staff but you don't have enough weight staff you have then the ability to use that fixed asset of the kitchen plus you have kitchen staff to be able to deliver that uh that 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 delivered that, that delivered meal yeah and no dishes to wash either right Oh, good point. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Although I don't know how green those packages are with all that styrofoam. Oh, yes. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. That's the that's the conundrum I see, but that's a whole nother discussion. We'll do that later on. Yeah, we so, can't uh, solve all the world, world's problems in one call, right? Yeah, that's right. Exactly. So, uh, well, anyway, you've talked a little bit about full throttle. Uh, why don't you give us kind of the, uh, like a really good case study or an example of how Full Throttle has been able to uh, enhance the sales of one of your clients. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, we talked about furniture, and I think that's that's really one that I that I think is exciting. I, you know, it, you, you think of businesses that have been doing things one way for a long time, and then they sort of get maybe not dragged, but you know, kind of nudged into the digital game, but they don't know where it's going to lead them, right? So make, most furniture independent retailers don't wanna be in the e-commerce game or they don't even have that ability, but we want them to be found. We want them to be able to compete against those giants that are taking a, a big share out of the market and what those giants aren't doing as well as these uh, independent retailers is taking care of those customers you know, on, inside uh, of their own stores, right? even the best customer service that you see online, it's, it's never going to match what John Smith, the furniture owner, uh, store owner in Tennessee can do uh, at a local level. So I love the fact that we're able to take our technology and help these businesses that are already figuring out how to get found online because they've, they've strengthened their SEO. They're putting their inventory out there. Their, their whole goal though, is to take that website experience and push it down the funnel to get these people to uh, to keep them engaged and to get them to come into the store. And what we've done is be able, is partner with um, you know one specific agency who who did a great job at, and and does a great job at creating that widening that funnel for them, but to help them bring those customers down the funnel. And you have to do it by identifying them. So we can take an anonymous website visitor and we know their name, their address, the source that they came in on, all from one single privacy compliant location share. What that does is it creates an opportunity to reach that customer, but it also creates an opportunity to measure that customer so that they can get an idea of what does it take to get somebody to come into store? What does that average shopping timeline look like? How can we influence that journey through increased communication and through, you know, a much more targeted approach to retargeting. And we've gone even a step further and added AI into that uh, mix because we're now up to over 52 million shoppers that we've watched, we've identified and watched all the way through the sales cycle and then gotten that match back information to be able to close the loop for attribution so that we can match an identified household with an actual sale. So now that our AI has learned and learned and learned and learned, it's actually doing more than just showing you what's going on and it influences the way that we retarget with direct mail. So we have this product called Smart Mail where you get retargeted with a, with a mailer in your mailbox three days after our technology has identified you on a website. 
as an anonymous shopper, right? So everybody's using cookies to retarget and they don't necessarily know who they're reaching, right? And they're, and they're reaching devices, but we're reaching a household. And now that our AI has learned and learned and learned, we're not just going to send that mailer to every single one we identify. We're going to send the mailers to those that deserve it. And mm. after 52 million samples, we know that if our AI says you're ready to buy, you're three times more likely to buy. So when we can identify that, continue to measure we can be discriminatory on who we want to send that mailer and help manage the costs of a campaign and still show attribution and only send the mailers to those who really deserve it. And we've seen increased growth for these independent retailers on a large scale and seeing increased budgets for direct mail because they're seeing the return. They're, it's not a spray and, and uh, pray. It never really was for us because we knew who we were sending it to. But if we were to compare how we used to use direct mail to retarget to now, we used to be spraying and pray. Yep. We would find an audience and we'd spray them all with a mailer. Now we're finding an audience, we're measuring that audience and we're strategically retargeting. So to see that uh, maturation in the way that we can help retailers and to see it work on the retail level every month, to hear my agency partners asking when the dashboard is going to be updated with the sales feed that they just sent me, that's great because I know that means they're excited to share that information down to their end client. And to have uh, advertisers or uh, advertising agencies excited for that monthly check-in meeting with their client is something that tells me we're doing something right and that, that we're making a difference on, on the business level for the end client. And my, you know, my, one of my resellers says, what does it do for my client? It is always what they want. And so now they don't have to ask, they can see it right there for them. So I think that that's a great success story. And then what's exciting to me is seeing how every single business and industry has a different set of needs. And I touched on it a little bit earlier that we can be flexible and create a program within the constraints constraints of our, um, you know, our ability to still to continue to uh, scale and control the control the quality of how we deliver for our customers. But maybe you don't need everything. Maybe it's just a data and a first party export um, relationship. But to be able to have those type of conversations where it's you want to buy something off the menu, we've got something that's perfect for you, or this is a much bigger conversation. Let's bring in the additional stakeholders let's, let's figure it out, um, is, uh, something that we love to do as well. So I'm excited yeah. uh, about the future. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, it, it is a fascinating approach. And one of the things that we've always found in, from an analytics perspective is if you can identify your prospects out of the huge opportunity or the whole base of, you know, prospects, but identify those prospects that have the behavior that they're ready to buy, uh, and then invest a little bit more in marketing or the right amount of money in marketing to strategically go after them, the ROI on that is, is enormous. And that's, that's where I, I really think your technology is uh, being almost a game changer uh, is, is pretty, pretty fascinating. And, and I think too, if you're a, 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 you know, a customer of yours and you have it before your your direct competitors, you're just gonna you know blow their socks off for quite a while. Yeah. And now I know you work in the uh, quite a bit in the automotive industry, and so my wife and I just started looking for a new car, and and uh, uh, now we haven't gotten any direct mail yet, but that may be because we haven't gone after the uh, we haven't gone to the dealerships. Uh, we sp spent most of our time on the on the manufacturer sites. But it was kind of interesting. So we were looking for, you know, Hyundai, Kia, Ford, Chevy. We were looking at all the SUVs. And the only one that is clearly now targeting us directly uh, and coming at us with uh, in, in connected TV is Hyundai. And oh, so we're seeing now I'm getting the Tucson, the Santa Fe, and I can't remember what the other ones are. And it's like constant now when we're watching any kind of a any kind of a program, it's bang, bang, bang with, uh, you know, Hyundai, Hyundai, Hyundai. So they, they definitely uh, are doing a good job at targeting. And, and if that's what you're doing uh, now with direct mail and, and helping those uh, dealerships to really send the stuff to the right people at the right time, that, that'll make a, an enormous difference. 
Oh, it, it will. And, and we're doing it on, uh, on television as well, too. We're just about to launch Smart Scheduler, which is a partnership we have with Spectrum mm. Reach and Effective. And, you know, this tells me that, that I'm working with a company that has their act together, that we have partnerships with companies at that level, that they see the need. It enhances the value of their products because they're able to use our ability to identify to create those target markets, but it's not just our ability to identify. It's the fact that we, for the right types of purchases, if we can get that match back information and then close that loop, they can show attribution on, you know, on a TV spot. And to do that at the hyper local level for mm. smaller businesses, I think it's, it's a really uh, much a leg up because uh, again, there's a lot of spray and, and, and pray when it comes to broadcast media and, you know, we call it building awareness and that's great. But if you've got somebody who's already aware, like someone like you, that you mentioned that out of all those OEMs you're dealing with, that the memorable one is Hyundai that's retargeting you and found a way to kind of stay in your mind because you're beyond awareness. Now they're, you're starting to get lower down into the funnel and pretty soon you're going to act. So if you can combine that uh, on the OEM level, and then when you get to the retail level, and you find the right uh, site that maybe is a partner of ours, then we'll be able to continue that conversation with you. And then that business will be able to measure that. And they, when you can get a sense of what that true timeline looks like, not after you've become a lead or been converted, it really changes the way that you look at how you're messaging. And so again, that's always a cherry on top. You know, We wanna be able to show direct ROI, connecting sales to households, but if you can do that and then you have the validity to say, this is your true buyer journey. This is, this is how many of those people bought within the first five days versus the next five days. How does that influence your strategy? We don't necessarily want to get involved into the weeds about those strategy conversations. We're open to have them, but we want to be careful and let the strategy people make their decisions on their own. But, you know, I use the uh, metaphor of at-bats. Those are at-bats for strategy people. So not only are we giving at-bats for marketers and messengers and content people to uh, drive behavior, but these strategy people are looking at uh, that timeline and all this different, these different elements that just come with the measurement, that that's really the icing on the cake and why it's exciting for me and sometimes confusing about who, whose attention am I going to be able to get, you know, at a big brand or at a big agency or even in a smaller one, what's the need? You know, I could come in thinking it's one thing and then it could be the other, but it's nice to have something that checks a lot of boxes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, I'm going to shift a little bit on the on the conversation, uh, but uh, it, it kind of all uh, holds together. So uh, when Hyundai advertised to us and it was directly the SUV, uh, you know, it was pretty obvious to me that we were being retargeted. And uh, my wife is sitting there and I says, well, what do you think? And she says, oh, yeah, you know, she didn't really uh, understand. And I said, well, that that targeting that they're doing is because they have identified us specifically based on our visit to the website. And she goes, oh, I don't like that. <laughs> so which then gets to the uh, I mean, she didn't know it. So she didn't see it as kind of being creepy. But as soon as you point it out to her, she goes, oh, that's kind of creepy. I don't know if I like that. And uh, so that kind of moves us now into kind of the uh, the privacy piece and the cookieless future piece. And so let's uh, let's talk about uh, that a little bit. Let's talk about the uh, what marketers need to really think about as it relates to the the cookieless piece, uh, the cookieless future, and how uh, privacy needs to be definitely uh, carefully guarded, but also as a part of this whole future. Yeah, and that is the line we walk, right? That line of intrusiveness, because um, sometimes a little bit of intrusiveness is what you need to continue that conversation, but being too uh, intrusive can be quite off-putting. What I like about what we do is that everything's based on a user action, that we're not going after somebody until they come to the specific site. The first thing that they do is they share their location most people, when they share their location, they have a sense that it, that information is going to be used to improve their buying or shopping experience. If you don't share your location, we're not going to bother you because we can't identify you. 
But if you share your location, what we want to do is give that brand the opportunity to reach you. And it's really up to us, I think, to make sure that we have the right type of partners. Um, and, you know, there's certain industries like medical, for example, where there's restrictions from HIPAA, but it's all about that user action first that, that we, you know, we may not be a fit for some industries uh, because ethically they just don't like to go to market like that. And we fully respect that. We don't try and hide behind the fact that what we're doing is literally resolving identity. And you go from anonymous to name, address, and most importantly, what source brought you in. So what we want to do for marketers is help them see that return because we don't exist if someone didn't already come to the site. So a site's doing something to drive that traffic. They're creating SEO content. They're, they're optimizing their site. They're paying for media. They're trying to grab an audience. So all we're trying to do is take that audience, identify them when they're willing, when they opt in, and then give an opportunity for that brand to reach back out with the right messaging to help them move uh, those consumers. And then to be able to tie that together, it's great to be insulated from uh, the cookie world because frankly, I wish they would have pulled the plug on it months ago. It probably would help me find more curious people out there. So I, I really do love the way that we've taken the approach from the very beginning of we saw the writing on the wall years ago and said, we're going to use location-based identification and it's going to be transparently opted in. And, you know, as consumers can uh, continue to become more savvy, I think that's where there might be uh, a little bit more strategy involved in that exchange for location. You know, how, how can you present it differently, present value when you're building awareness? I think uh, uh, that that's really where it's, in my opinion, going to come that, You've got to find the right audiences and build the right awareness to target these people that are in market. And if they're in market, I think that they're always going to be more apt to, uh, to share their location. And then it's on the marketers to do the right thing with that information. And, you know, having a partner that's completely securing that first party data that isn't sharing it. We mm. don't share. We work with thousands of websites. We don't share information between any of the others. And if there's ever a conflict between, um, you know, one reseller in a different industry, we make sure to keep things separate because it's really all about that customer, their traffic, and those households and attributing those households back to their sales. And then it's in a fault and it's all in its own silos. So we have a lot of those silos uh, over at Full Throttle. It'll be interesting yeah. to see how, uh, how people navigate it in the future. But I think the data is currency, that first party data is currency. And, and what we like to say is own your data. So to be able to break down the walled gardens of big tech, to, to be able to give someone the opportunity to take their traffic that they earned because they drove that traffic to their site and their front door, people knocked and say, you can go and take that and activate it agnostic of any platform. And whenever they buy, if you tell us, not who they are, but literally when they bought and what their address is, we keep all that, um, those names out of the mix when we're exchanging, then we can make those connections mm. and we can show you your attribution. Do we offer activations? Yeah, we are, offer them with the, with the big tech um, and we're happy to do so. But if a client or a partner has a good thing running, that's where I mentioned, it's great to be able to have the ability to say, we can enhance, not disrupt what you're doing. And um, if you want us to handle it all, we can do that. But if you want us to just enhance, we can do that as well and sort of figure out uh, on a case-by-case -case basis how right. we can help each individual customer, each individual right. agency. So what do you, because uh, uh, you know, one, one of the things that I think marketers have a uh, real challenge with is there's a lot of really good technology coming at them and, uh, uh, you know, and unfortunately, it's kind of tough to weed out the ones that are might be good, but they're not good for their industry. Uh, so what do you do? What do you where do you uh, what kind of data or uh, news sources or whatever? What do you really see as your source for really good marketing technology coming uh, coming down the line that would be valuable for uh, for for marketers nowadays? You know, there's, there is there's so much out there. There's so much that does similar things. 
and um, and there's a lot of people that are invested in similar products or maybe something that maybe isn't as good um, as what we have. And so what I have to constantly remember is that it's a marathon, not a sprint, that the more that I can plant seeds of knowledge, or I like to say, be an arrow in the quiver of people out there, companies out there, the better, because the timing is never as perfect as it is for me. I, you know, I, so we have to be persistent on our team to make sure that we're staying out there, that, we, that we're not putting all of our energy into one uh, specific opportunity or have these expectations that just because we know that or think that it might work, that there haven't been two years worth of conversations and decisions made to get them to where they are. And, and I saw that a ton when I worked on the Chevrolet campaign or the Chevrolet account, because you're talking about a giant brand that nothing is simple. And it's not, it's no knock on Chevrolet. They're a giant brand. They're all over the world. And one little domino can create a whole lot of confusion. So things have to be timed up the right way. And I think from my perspective, I'm less focused on what else is out there and the competition and staying up to date on things because I want to be more focused on finding more brains to plant that seed of knowledge in and nurturing those conversations and listening and learning about where the problems are, not necessarily other solutions that are out there because we want to make sure we learn first and then walk, crawl really, walk and then run. And even when we form a new partnership, the first thing that we do with our technology is literally put it on a website and we don't do any activations all, and we don't charge anything for this. We call it our data trial and learn because the first thing we want to do, even mm -hmm. after we've learned and learned and learned about the prospect and what their needs are and how we could potentially solve problems for them, the road meets the rubber on the web. And we need that user action to give us that basically that net audience of opportunity um, through our software's ability to identify those yeah. households. And then it's exciting to be able to not only offer that, yes, it makes that sales conversation even longer, right? The one that I said could take years, it's months, uh, you know, we're willing to do it for months, whatever it takes so that we're not going in blind, that we're learning as we go, that we can set the right expectations and that we can prove that we can create opportunities, but not just opportunities to identify, right? Opportunities for those strategies. Yeah, and that I think is the and that I think is the uh, the critical piece is uh, really being able to to follow that, but also you know don't to get don't get distracted uh, too much. So, uh, but anyway, I've got to uh, we're going to have to uh, uh, close here. But before we do that, just uh, and do you have any other uh, comments or uh, thoughts that you'd like to uh, put, bring across? You know, not really. Just I just want to tell anybody out there who's listening to be curious and uh, take the uh, take the call if you're curious, uh, and uh, especially if somebody's persistent, because um, we're all juggling a lot of things, and it's uh, it never hurts to know what's out there, and it's always helpful to have another seed planted. Uh, you know, our brains can handle it, and. Um, so I encourage everybody to uh, to be curious, and if you hear from me, you better you better answer. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I do like that, and uh, and I think I think that is a, a huge differentiator is uh, is being curious, and and that that does make a lot of sense. Well, so anyway, uh, Pete, thank you uh, so much. Uh, it's really been awesome, and really appreciate your time today, and. Thank you for participating in our podcast and certainly help me to, uh, you know, educate me on, on, on how you really can use this, uh, this location based data privacy, you know, totally privacy compliant to help out uh, that one to one marketing paradigm to really take your take uh, uh, web marketers to the next level. Uh, otherwise, uh, so uh, Pete's website. Uh, is fullthrottle.ai, fullthrottle.ai. And if you're interested there, you'll find a lot more information on uh, what Pete calls closed loop marketing. And then of course, uh, always stay, uh, stay curious. Yeah. And uh, with that, stay curious with, uh, with, my, with my blog and with my videos, and then certainly with my 
uh, podcast, The Backstory on Marketing. And you'll be able to find more information on that for uh, at the pro, uh, prorelevant.com and sign up for a blog, uh, blog and podcast. Pete, thank you so much. Thanks, Guy. It's been fun. Thank you.